This morning we're continuing in the Sermon on the Mount and we're going to be looking at chapter 6. Actually, throughout the entirety of the day, we're going to cover verses 1 through 18. I'm going to go ahead and read those as we begin, but we're, we're not going to deal with verses 7 through uh, 15. Those are the ones we're going to look at this evening. That would be uh, the Lord's Prayer. Um, so what we're going to look at are those three areas that I talked about earlier. Uh, the giving of uh, alms, prayer, and fasting. Would you listen carefully now to what I am reading? This is the word of our Lord. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor... Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition, as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in heaven, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Well, again, we're going to be looking at those sections that that are all basically dealing with the common theme of not doing what we do to be noticed uh, by by men. Well, Jesus, having now told us that he came to fulfill the law or to fill it up by keeping it, um, that we might have a perfect example of how it is we are to live and that he might also give us the power to live in the same way. Now, turns in his sermon to deal with three things that outside of the ordinary worship of God's people on on the Sabbath in the Jewish culture would be the three main things that he would want them to do and, and I believe wants us to do as well in our service to him. Now, again, I would remind you that Jesus here is speaking to a Jewish audience who were still under the Old Covenant And these were things that they were aware of and things that they knew God had called them to do. And as I've already pointed out, they are the same, basically the same three things the Pharisee went into the temple in order to do. Remember, he had come to pray. And remember what he had come to pray about. He came to pray about his giving and his fasting. Now, what they would have done is not exactly the same thing as it would be for us. Certainly, these things of of giving to the poor and of praying and of fasting are things we would do. But today, we would add other things like the reading of God's Word. In those days, only the rich and the religious elite would have had copies of the Scriptures. 
uh, so that the rank and file Jew really wouldn't have the leisure to read the Word of God whenever they wanted to. They would have to rely on what it is they heard from week to week in the synagogue. By the way, what they heard during the week in the synagogue, because they didn't have you know, copies of the Scripture, meant that they would memorize what they heard and they would meditate on it during the week. As a matter of fact, the Jews were known for having fabulous memories. They were trained to memorize what they heard from a very early age so that they would have it on hand uh, during uh, the time when, of course, they wouldn't have uh, access to the Scriptures. So we would add reading of, of the Scriptures, and we would also add evangelism. Now, Jesus doesn't emphasize evangelism here, perhaps because this was one of the things that Jesus was actually training his disciples to do in this sermon. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, I think there's a great deal of instruction here about evangelism. It's not just that, but it certainly is one of the elements. And because I believe that while Jesus was training his disciples to do evangelism through the sermon, he was also evangelizing. I mean, let's not forget that there were many other people who were there and the things that he was saying to his disciples were actually meant for the others who had gathered as well, the crowds who were following him because of the miracles that he had done. We actually read about that in the chapter previous to the Sermon on the Mount. Through this sermon, Jesus was challenging them. Uh, he was challenging what they had been taught. He is challenging what they had seen by way of example. He was warning them to get off the broad road that the leaders of Israel were encouraging everybody to walk on and to get onto that narrow road that actually leads to life. That's very integral to this sermon. Now, this morning, though, we are going to see Jesus challenge their teachers, the teachers of Israel, in these three areas, in giving to the poor, in prayer, and in fasting, to show us how these things really should be done as over against how their religious leaders were actually doing them. So what we want to look at this morning are three things regarding these three things. First of all, what the Lord calls us to do, which is, as I've said, giving to the poor, prayer and fasting. The right way and the wrong way of doing these things, which is the second thing we're going to look at. And of course, why it matters that we do it the way the Lord calls us to and not the way the leaders of Israel were doing it. Now, first of all, Jesus tells us what it is he wants us to do in our service for him. He wants us to give. He wants us to pray. He wants us to fast. And again, as I've already reminded you, he also wants us to be reading our Bibles so we can learn more about what it is he wants us to do and we need to be sharing what it is that we know so that others will also come to know him as well. But we're going to focus on these three things. Now, the first thing I want us to notice in this section is this, that Jesus is really not here issuing a command. He's not commanding us to do these things. But he's first of all assuming that this is what we will be doing if we belong to him. He says in, in verse 2, so when you give to the poor, notice he doesn't say, so give to the poor, but he says when you give to the poor. Verse 5, when you pray. Verse 16, whenever you fast. And by the way, whenever is still the same word in the Greek. Perhaps the translators chose to use a different word. But it means essentially the same thing. When you do these things, this is the way you're supposed to do it. Now, we will do these things. And Jesus assumes that his disciples will be doing these things because of the new nature. Let's never forget that Jesus is not giving to us a blueprint on how to enter into heaven, do this and you will live. He's giving us a blueprint on how to live the Christian life, which is what he's given us the desire to do through the new heart and the new affections he's given to us in the new birth. This is what the Spirit of God will be moving us to do. He will move us to reach out to relieve the suffering of the poor, of those who don't have enough to meet their own needs. Now again, I just quickly distinguish what Jesus is talking about here from just simply doling out money to everybody who asks you because the Lord tells us that we are not to enable those people who do not want to work 
but to help those who cannot work, who cannot take care of themselves. So Jesus here is talking about that. Now in the Old Testament, we see that the poor were continually on the Lord's heart. He had compassion for the poor, which is why he called his people to care for them. And there's actually several passages of instruction in the Old Testament. For instance, uh, you know, the Jewish culture was a very agricultural-based culture. Uh, everybody pretty much lived off the land, which is why the land, one of the reasons why the land was so important to them. But the Lord gave them instruction that when they harvested, they were to leave some for the poor so that they could glean. We read in Leviticus 19, verses 9 through 10. Now, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And of course, in that culture, the needy and the stranger would actually go in there and pick up those pieces of fruit and glean to the edges of the field in order to meet their needs. The Lord further told them that every seventh year they were not to sow and reap but to leave their fields alone, to give their fields a Sabbath rest. And whatever grew of itself during those years would be exclusively for the poor. He says through Moses in Exodus 23 verses 10 and 11, you shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield, but on the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat. And whatever they leave, the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Now that only covers, of course, a couple of times of the year, and that would be during the times of the harvest. So what happens during the rest of the year? Well, the Lord commanded his people to be aware of the needs of those who are around them and to do what they could to meet those needs. He says in Leviticus 25, verse 35, now, in case a countryman of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. The Lord wanted his people to be aware of the needs of those around them and to give where they had the opportunity to give. Now, Jesus has already told us in this sermon that his heart in this area has not changed. God still has the same heart. I mean, God is the one who is kind to ungrateful and evil men, as we've already seen. And Jesus has already told us in Matthew 5, verse 42, Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. We looked, when we were looking at this particular passage, and we were reminded again, as I've said before, Jesus is not telling us to enable those who can work not to work, because that would be sin. But what he's saying is help those who cannot help themselves, who would perish apart from your help. And we know that the Lord Jesus himself often gave from what little he had. And essentially, you know, the, he and the disciples didn't really have that much. They had the clothes on their back, the staff on their hands, or in their hands, and they also had a, a small bag from which others, basically others would contribute to them. They would keep that money in the bag. We know that Judas was often stealing from that bag. But they also used the money that was in that bag to help the poor. It's not real obvious, and I think because of what our Lord is going to tell us a little bit later, that these things are not to be done ostentatiously, but rather in secret. And so we really don't know too much about what happened, but we do know that it happened from this particular passage in John 13, verses 27 through 29. We read, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him, that is Judas Iscariot. Therefore Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have needed for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. Now why would they have supposed that that's what Jesus said to Judas? if it wasn't something that they were constantly doing. Jesus was giving to the poor. And we know he gave in many other ways too. He fed uh, the 5,000, he fed the 4,000. He was continually healing, continually ministering, continually giving. Now because we are God's children who share the same nature, 
we will do the same thing. We will give to those who are in need. Now, secondly, we will also pray. That also is a part of the, the new nature. As a matter of fact, something which we cannot help but actually doing. I thought William Gurnall brought this out really well in this particular quote. He says, praying is the same to the new creature, and he's talking about that new creation God has placed in us, as crying is to the natural. The child is not learned or is not taught by art or example to cry, but instructed by nature. It comes into the world crying. Praying is not a lesson got by forms and rules of art, but flowing from principles of the new life itself. If there is life, there will be prayer. Okay, so prayer is a part of the new nature. Now again, we have many examples in the Bible of God's people seeking the Lord in prayer. David writes in Psalm 5, verses 1 through 3, which is what we're going to read for our call to worship this evening. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. By the way, our Lord Jesus did this. And this is an example also for us. We should be praying, beginning in the morning. He also writes in our call to worship uh, this morning, in Psalm 32, verse 6, Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Now, I've already told you that Jesus' life was marked by prayer. I mean, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we? And I don't think he prayed just as an example to us, but he prayed because he needed the help that prayer brings. Jesus prayed every morning. Jesus prayed at his baptism. Jesus prayed before he called his disciples. Jesus prayed many other times, and perhaps the most poignant being when he was preparing to offer himself up on the cross, he prayed, and he prayed uh, very earnestly. And he also prayed on the cross that the Father would forgive those crucifying him and that the Father would also receive his spirit. And we know from Scripture that Jesus continues to pray for us from heaven. Prayer is essential to the Christian life. Now, this is what our Lord also calls us to do. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing, which doesn't mean, of course, that we need to be praying now and, and every moment that we're awake, but what he means is that we need to continually be seeking the Lord for the things that actually we're going to be looking at this evening in the Lord's Prayer. And of course, because again, we are the Lord's and we're being transformed into his image, this is what we will do. And thirdly, we will fast, perhaps not as frequently as we pray, but we will. We will separate ourselves from our daily business, from our daily food, to humble our souls before the Lord and to seek his face even more earnestly for what we need when the situation requires it. You know, often we see, except for the religious fasts, and of course the fasts that the Pharisees would do for their self-righteousness, we typically see fasts taking place when the people of God really needed God's help and they really needed it right away. When Nehemiah found out about his people, the Jews, and the condition of Jerusalem after the captivity, and he found out about it in Babylon, he writes in Nehemiah 1.4, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven because of the gravity of the situation of God's people, that God would do something about it. And we know God did. When Esther saw that the only way to save her people from Haman's uh, treachery, basically, and getting the king to sign into, this, this, into law, the fact that God's enemies could destroy the Jews, when she saw that her only way to save her people was to go into the presence of the king, which she knew would likely mean her death, she said to Mordecai in Esther 4, verse 16, Go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. 
I and my maidens also will fast in the same way, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So again, fasting was done under times of great duress when they needed God's mercies and they needed them fast. This was the way to do it. Now, Jesus, we know, fasted in his ministry as well, although I can only recall one time he did it, and that was after his baptism, when he went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. That is <clears throat> an extremely long fast, uh, and not one that, that is commended to us necessarily. But I should say, the only other person who fasted this long was Moses, but he did two 40-day fasts back to back. <laughs> we can only do that with the supernatural help of the Lord. But he also says to his disciples and to us that we also will fast. Now, Jesus' disciples did not fast when they were present with him, but they certainly did fast uh, when he was taken away. And Jesus told them uh, that they would. In Matthew 9, verses 14 and 15, Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. By the way, notice the connection between fasting and mourning. Whenever we fast, we are to humble ourselves and basically uh, remember our, our sins and our unworthiness in the sight of the Lord and mourn, grieve over them. It's a means of humbling our souls God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, and fasting is one way in which we can do that. And certainly our Lord Jesus tells us in our passage that we will fast. So it's not really a question of whether we're going to do these things. It's really a question of when we are going to do these things because these things should be a regular part of our lives, and they will be if the Spirit of God is living in us. But now Jesus also tells us, secondly, that there's a right way of doing this and a wrong way. If we have the new nature, we will do them secretly to be seen by God and not openly to be seen by men. In other words, we will do them with the right motive. We will do them for God's honor and not for our honor. Now, Jesus tells us that if we find ourselves like the Pharisees, uh, the scribes, doing these things pretending as though we are trying to honor God, but we are really trying to honor ourselves or doing them so that we'll look better, he essentially says, we'll, well, we're, we're hypocrites. That's what he called the scribes and the Pharisees. And by the way, all of us are guilty of that to some degree. All of us have a measure of hypocrisy. It's because of the sin still in us, but we shouldn't be purely hypocritical. There should be the good motives that are in us as well because we really want to do what the Lord calls us to do. But let's not forget what hypocrite means. Hypocrite is simply the Greek word for an actor. What Jesus is saying is they're putting on an act. They're putting on a show. It's not genuine. Now, uh, Sinclair Ferguson, you'll recall in his study on the Sermon on the Mount, pointed this out, which I think we ought to listen to because we see it all over the place today. And that is that those who are the most intensely religious, and we could add to that the most public uh, in their display of piety, they are more often than not the hypocrites. Now, this isn't always the case, but it, often it is particularly in a society like ours, which is driven by celebrities. So many people want to be admired. We all want to be singled out, to be special in some area, and it's something we have to guard ourselves against. Now, the same was certainly true in Jesus' day. He says in verse 2, So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Now, what, what, what is Jesus talking about here? I mean, did they literally go out and blow trumpets? Some people say that Jesus was just using hyperbole, but others believe that this is actually what they did. And the reason why they did it was because they wanted the poor, 
to be gathered together in one place so that they could give them this, this, you know, this money, this act of charity. So they would have somebody blow a trumpet, and the trumpet meant that somebody was standing there waiting to do this act of charity for them. Now, what they really wanted to do, of course, was draw everybody's attention to, to themselves and to the charity they were about to give to their own personal piety. He says in verse 5, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. That reminds me of a worship service that I was in years ago where everybody was seated, everybody was worshiping, but then one person decided to stand up and just raise up his hands like this. The usher came by and seated him. And he was incensed over it. Not the usher, but the other guy who got seated. But the reason why he was seated was so he wouldn't stand out. You know, everybody wouldn't be looking at him, but everybody would be looking at the Lord instead. And that's what our Lord is, is telling us here. These scribes and Pharisees loved to stand in public places for prayer. They loved to stand out so that everybody could see their devotion to God. And he says in verse 16, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. They wanted to make sure that everybody knew they were making this sacrifice for God, that they were doing something super special, seeking God for some mercy. Now, as I've said, with so many in the church today, in the church you know, at, at large, going out of their way to display all that they are doing for God, blowing their own horns, so to speak, it can be difficult to do what Jesus actually calls us to do in this passage, to do what we do in such a way that only the Heavenly Father sees them. Because the tendency is going to want, you know, is again to want to one-up them or to show you, uh, to show the, the others who are talking about what they're doing that, hey, I'm, I'm just as good as you are, I'm doing these things, or maybe, again, to try to do this one-up sort of thing. But we can't do that, you see. Jesus doesn't want us to point out what we're doing. He doesn't want us to try to one-up one another. He wants us to do what we do in a secret way. And that's exactly what we will want to do, what the Spirit of God is moving us to do. We need to resist the flesh, which is causing us to do the other thing. Now, Jesus goes on in verses 3 and 4 to tell us how we ought to do things. He says, but when you give to the poor... Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. Does that mean that uh, you're supposed to, um, you know, uh, with your left hand, pass it off to your right and somehow escape what's going on? This is um, actually a proverbial expression that was used to refer to doing something as secretly as it could possibly be done. Jonathan Edwards, uh, it, this came out after his death and probably by some well-meaning individual who was involved in what he was doing, but Jonathan Edwards had a large family and he, he was a huge church that he was ministering to, but he didn't have a, a huge income. But what he had, he wanted to do what the Lord was calling him to do to help those who had nothing. And so he would often set aside some money to give to the poor, but when he did, he would never go directly to them and give it to them. Instead, he had a friend that he would give the money to and he would have the friend deliver the money anonymously so that Edwards would not get the credit for it, but rather the Lord would. We should try to give anonymously. He says in verse 6 with regard to prayer, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. Now, he doesn't mean that we can't pray publicly together. As a matter of fact, the Lord's Prayer appears to include the idea that, that we'll be gathering together for public prayer. But what he is saying is that when we pray privately, we should keep that between ourselves and God. And even when we pray publicly, like the Pharisees and the scribes, not to, not to stand out. You know, let's, let's not try to get into prayer wars, this is perhaps another way that we can kind of do this, right? I mean, it's like, well, somebody just prayed this very elo eloquent prayer. Well, that sounded really spiritual. Now, 
I've got to pray. How am I going to pray? Well, I'm going to try to match that, or I'm going to try to go beyond that and say something even more spiritual and more moving. Well, no, we, we, we are not to draw attention to ourselves. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we ought to speak few words to the Lord and speak them directly to Him. We need to be careful how we pray, that we don't try to draw attention to ourselves. And then he says in verses 17 and 18 with regard to fasting, but you, when you pray, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. In other words, try to look as normal as you can when you're fasting. You may not feel well. You may feel weak. You may want to express that, but, but look normal so the people cannot see what you're doing, but only your Heavenly Father can. Don't, he says, put your piety on display. Do what you do to be seen of your Heavenly Father. Except for those things, of course, that can't be avoided, such as the public service that we are to offer the Lord. Uh, Jesus tells us that we are to let our light shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. But even when we do this, we need to make sure we're doing them so that they see the Father in us and that they don't just see us. We are to try to draw attention to the Lord. Now, finally, you know, we've seen the three things we are to do. There are still things we ought to be doing as new covenant believers. We've seen how we're to do them, you know, not ostentatiously, not publicly, but secretly. Finally, what difference does it make whether we do it one way or the other? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 1, and this is really his main point behind all what he's saying here. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Okay, so it's a question of what you're going to get out of it, right? Well, do you realize that Jesus is telling us here that there are rewards for doing these things if we do them as we should do them? which is to honor the Father. The Lord says that if we give to the poor, He will reward us. Solomon writes in Proverbs 19, verse 17, which is what we use for our meditation, one who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and He will repay him for his good deed. David writes in Psalm 41, verse 1, how blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. There is a reward for giving to the poor. When we pray, the reward is that the Lord will hear us and He will answer us. He will give us what it is we're asking for if we do it the way He calls us to. Jesus says in John 14, verses 13 and 14, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. See, that, that is the reward for prayer, receiving what it is you're asking for. Now, he will particularly do what we ask for when we fast as well as pray. Remember what happened when the Jews fasted with Esther? The Lord uh, allowed her to go in to see her, her husband. The king was her husband, but he could very easily have put her to death if he didn't extend the, the golden rod, as you recall, his golden scepter. But he did because the Lord heard their prayers and the Lord allowed the Jews not only to protect themselves but also to avenge themselves and destroy their enemies. The Lord brought a tremendous victory because God's people humbled themselves in prayer and in fasting. And we know that Nehemiah, when he humbled himself and he fasted and prayed, the Lord moved the king's heart and commissioned Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild those walls to fix the problem. Now, if we do these things openly for the benefit of others so that they will think more highly of us. If we happen to gain their applause, Jesus says that's all we're going to get. We will not get anything from God. If we're praying to be heard by other people, we're not going to get what we're asking for. We are going to get what other people think of us, and that is all. We see this refrain in verses 2 and 5, and in verse 16, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. That's all they're going to get. You seek the applause of men, you may get the applause of men, but you won't get what the Father has to give you.
If we want what the Father promises, which I think we all agree is far more precious than the applause of men, we must do these things as much as we can secretly for his eyes only to honor him. As Jesus tells us in verses 4, 6, and 18, which is a refrain of the blessing, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. He will give you those things if you are earnestly seeking Him. Now this evening we are going to see some other things regarding prayer, but this morning this is what we, we do want to see. So may the Lord give us grace to be able to do what we do with regard to these areas and everything that we do for his glory and not for the glory of men. Now let's, let's bow together in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us to do that.